In this episode of Kitchen Nightmares The Aftermath, the French finally invade England and serve them up some rock-hard Yorkshire puddings. Gordon gets up to his sneaky antics and dumps unwanted food into a pot plant. Two clueless owners who love beetroot so much, they decided to rub it on their restaurant walls. And Friar Tuck infiltrates the restaurant from the inside, vowing to only deep fry everything on the menu. Will King Gordon be able to rally the troops and send the French back to the sea? Will the owners stop rubbing beetroot all over the place and use it in a salad? Will anyone notice the rotting food in the pot plant? And can Gordon foil Robin Hood and Friar Tuck's plot to deep fry the whole menu? All this and more in today's episode, so keep watching and satisfy your curiosity. Subscribe to the channel while you're at it. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Kitchen Nightmares The Aftermath. Spoilers ahead for Kitchen Nightmares Season 1, Episode 4, and Season 2, Episode 7. This is the last episode of Kitchen Nightmares Season 1. The next video upload will start with Season 2 as we progress with the Aftermath series. I would like to thank you all for your support and feedback. It's been immensely helpful, and I appreciate it very much. In today's episode, Gordon visits more place, the maroon building you've all probably seen before. More place is situated in Esher, Surrey. Gordon mentions that the area is quite affluent, with stockbrokers, ladies who lunch, and people who frequently golf living in the vicinity of more place. Yet, the restaurant fails to attract any of those big spenders. Despite 35,000 rounds of golf being played on the Moore Place golf course every year. Upon arrival, Gordon mentions that the restaurant looks similar to a local prison for young offenders, and that he only has a week, as usual, to turn the place around. When entering, he sees that there is no one else inside the restaurant, and that he is the only diner they will be serving. For a starter, he gets served deep fried caiman bear. Before tasting the dish, Gordon says a prayer asking the creator for safekeeping and not to be food poisoned for the third time in four months. After tasting the dish, he mentions that it's horrible and tries to wash it down with some wine, only to find out the wine stinks, which is a clear indicator that the wine has gone bad. After not being able to find any waiter, he decides to dump the uneaten dish into the plants. The following dish is duck. He describes it as being tough and being reminiscent of dishes being served in the 1970s. After giving the waitress a taste, she agrees that the duck is tough, but refuses to spit it out. He later meets up with the owners, Richard Hodgins and Nick Whitehouse. The two of them together have sunk almost all their money into the place, and it's still a disaster. It should also be mentioned that they have no experience in the restaurant business at all. Gordon mentions in narration that the establishment used to be a successful restaurant named Bernie's and back in the day. In the kitchen we find Herb Foutrell, who was the French head chef when they took over. He still cooks the same dishes that they had before Nick and Richard bought the place. We also get to meet Mark Robinson, who is the executive head chef. He trained to be a chef but later went to get his business degree, before coming back to the kitchen. He was employed to help get the kitchen in order, but since his arrival spent a lot of money on microwaves and fryers with no positive results. There are two people inside the restaurant so Gordon decides to observe the way they serve their customers. He notices almost everything gets deep fried, and the oil is dark brown and smells like it hasn't been changed for months. He also notices nothing is prepped in advance, leading to customers waiting longer for their dishes. Mark, who has been brought in to change things up, has not revamped the menu at all, instead letting the kitchen staff cook dishes from the fryers and the microwaves. This leads Gordon to the realization that none of the staff, nor the owners really care about the customers. The following day, there are absolutely no customers in the restaurant. Gordon asks the waitress if they have any bookings for lunch and dinner, to which she replies no. She adds that one potential customer came in to look at the place, but added that he might choose them or TGIs. To add insult to injury, the owners have also hired a new head chef, which tells Gordon that they know something is wrong, but are not taking the correct steps to rectifying it. Andy Trowell, the new head chef, is 21 years old. Gordon has a chat with him to find out what he is like, and explains to him that he has his work cut out for him inside. He asks Gordon how he should approach the situation, 
and he gets a few tips, from narrowing down the menu to having a look at what's going on locally. After the talk they take a walk through the storeroom, and Gordon shows him the bought in sauces and packaged meats. He tells Nick that he can create all these from scratch for cheaper. After talking with Nick, Gordon walks through the restaurant with the owners, trying to find their reasoning for the horrible color they chose. Their excuse is that they chose the color to show a change of ownership in the business. However, they also mention that it may have alienated much of the original clientele. Gordon tells them that they have it the wrong way around, as they should rather be focusing on the food instead, since the food will keep the customers coming back. Gordon then decides to take Richard for a walk through town, to see where most of his former customers are now eating. They discover a ton of restaurants serving high-end clients, and find that many Americans also dine in the area. They all work for a huge conglomerate close by. What Gordon is trying to do is show Richard how much business he is losing out on by not changing up the menu. They proceed to engage with some of the pedestrians and ask them about more place, and hopefully get some clients in for lunch and dinner. Most of the people respond that they no longer go there, due to the horrible color it is painted. Gordon then sits down with management and the chefs and discusses his plans to head to a more American-influenced menu and reducing the size of it as well. However, Mark has some objections as he is worried about upsetting older clientele. Gordon quickly shuts him down, asking him if older clientele are keeping the doors open, to which Richard responds no, and they come to an agreement to start implementing the new changes. Gordon and Andy then whip up an amazing burger from scratch, an organic flame-grilled burger patty with tomato chutney and topped with parmesan cheese. Richard and Nick taste the burgers and absolutely love it. Gordon also adds new dishes to the menu, such as corned beef hash, pecan pie and smoked haddock chowder. Gordon then sets off with Kim and Andy to hunt down some potential customers on the golf course to get them to have a taste of the new dishes. The golfers also love the new dishes, but some of them have a few complaints, like the one gentleman says he waited so long for his breakfast. He left. However, if things change, he will be back. Kim gets the great idea to ask the golfers they meet to come in for Mother's Day. It absolutely works, and Gordon goes full on with the idea. Friday night is Andy's night off and Mark is running the kitchen. Instead of being behind the line and prepping for the dinner service, he is out in the front of house complaining to waiters about how they fold the napkins. However, Kim is already selling the new dishes and the customers are ordering them. Some of the waiters, Gordon notes, need training as they don't memorize the dishes and have no ability to sell them to diners such as Kim does. One table orders the Cayman Bear, and they send it back after eating due to it being frozen. Mark then makes some new Cayman Bear and personally delivers it to the table. Gordon then realizes he has to get the front of house up to scratch, as they can't serve properly and are struggling with just nine customers, since he himself had to help them bring food to the diners. The next day they set out to train the staff. Gordon and Nick pretend to be customers and the wait staff serve them so Gordon can give criticism and training. He notices that Peter, though being there for 15 years struggles with pitching, Kim of 5 years is charming but has little experience, and Zach being there only one week has absolutely no exp experience. Gordon mentions he worked as a waiter before, and spends most of the day training them. He also lets them taste the food, so they can better describe them to the customers. It does take a little patience, but as they progress he can see an improvement. Gordon decides to use Mother's Day for the relaunch of More Place. He brings in a friend of his, Jason, to teach the staff how to cut whole chicken. He goes with this specific dish to take pressure off the kitchen, as there are 181 bookings for the day, and he is worried that the front of house won't be able to cope with all the orders. Everyone gets along with trying to cut the whole chickens. Gordon even has the owner's practice, as he mentions to them they have to chip in. It also comes to Gordon's attention the owners overbooked the restaurant, they do however have little experience in the business, and may have had a different idea of how long a table usually takes to finish up dinner. Mark still has some objections over the menu, as he says that older customers are used to the older dishes. Gordon again shuts him down, and tells him that they don't know what the new dishes taste like, and should instead focus on getting dishes cooked properly and leaving the kitchen and leave the ordering up to the customers themselves. Gordon then along with the owners set about to move some furniture around, to help improve the look of the restaurant. After, the, after they're done, Gordon tests Richard again to see if he can carve a chicken. Amazingly, he gets it right, jokingly telling Gordon he has been practicing at home. So the big night has come, and Gordon is helping the brigade in the kitchen prepare for the evening. After assisting them, he gives the front of house a quick pep talk as well. Kim, Nick, Richard and Peter are working the floor, 
while Zack, after not being able to memorize the menu properly, is set to bar duty. After some time none of the customers has ordered the chicken, but Peter manages to bag one order. After that, a frenzy of chicken orders hit the kitchen and soon everyone is rising to the occasion to order it, and having it cut at their table. A table of 15, 14 and 19 shows up. This causes a backup of customers having to wait up to an hour and a half. The kitchen gets a little backed up as well, as they have to cook for nearly 50 people at one time. Some of the customers start to complain, and it turns out that Richard and Nick weren't really helping out as they should have. However, they manage to pull it off with over half of the customers leaving satisfied. All in all, the night was a success. Upon Gordon's revisit, the restaurant is still maroon. However, Andy has managed to revamp the menu using some of Gordon's ideas, and Mark has left to run his own pub. Only Herb and Andy are still in the kitchen, as some of the other kitchen staff had also left. The food is fresh, and they are fully booked for dinner services. Gordon also took the liberty of sending in a food critic. He only had one complaint about deep fried rocket, but Andy had already taken it off the menu. However, when ordering from the bar menu, Gordon again finds deep fried foods. He comes to the conclusion that this might be the reason why the restaurant is still empty during lunch services. He has a talk with Andy, Richard, and Nick to slowly start taking the deep fried foods off the menu and incorporating some of the main restaurant dishes into it. Gordon also takes the liberty of dumping the deep fryer into one of the ponds on the golf course. Nick and Richard are engaging with the customers, and the waiters are starting to enjoy their jobs. Gordon sits down and talks with Richard and Nick, and finds out customers love the food, and none of the dishes get sent back. The turnover is up 20%, and they realize Andy is a great asset to their restaurant. So what happened next? After appearing in the show, Richard spoke to The Guardian and a few other newspapers, saying that he didn't regret being a participant, as it brought him great success. He added they were getting clients from America and Australia, who have seen the show and absolutely love the food. Nick also had a piece in the articles, he mentioned at times they get so busy. He had to help flip burgers in the kitchen. However, it looks like more place went back to their old habits, and probably worse. It was sold in and became the esteemed bar and restaurant. The restaurant according to some articles was granted a late night liquor license. This turned out to be a bad idea, as a ton of complaints from neighbors came after that. Police had to frequently come to the scene as well. These complaints ranged from public urination, noise, drunkenness and a mass of others. I couldn't find any reviews for the esteem bar and restaurant online. People also still complained about the hideous color of the restaurant. However, Richard in a different article attributed the downfall of the restaurant to a decline in the demand of golf. It is good to note that Richard was still, was still a co-licensee in the Moore Place Holdings at the time. They also expressed interest in developing the area to build care homes. This is what Moore Place looks like today. It has been turned into a care home. Looks like they went through with the plans. As for Richard, I have no concrete evidence, but his name does pop up as being the owner of the penthouse in Petworth. However, as I stated I have no concrete proof of this. His name does appear on contact information frequently, but his LinkedIn history does not include the more place. The picture of his profile doesn't quite look like him, but we also have to keep in mind that it's almost 20 years after the episode was filmed. Nick Whitehouse also seems to have disappeared. I found a LinkedIn profile on him as well. I cannot for sure say that this is him, but when searching their names in more place together, this is the results I get. They also didn't list owning the more place as work experience, quite possibly to avoid being associated with a failed restaurant. That can be viewed on international television. The picture on his profile kinda looks like him, but I still cannot be sure. Andy Trowell seems to be going strong as ever, as he went to work at Epsom Downs Racecourse after more place, then a chef lecturer at South Thames College and finally settling at Epsom College where is still present today. Chef Herve, after working a few more years in London, went back to France to open a seafood restaurant. The articles, all in French, describe his journey from emigrating to London and moving back with his British wife and opening the Blue Marine. The restaurant has some really good reviews on TripAdvisor and also has its own website. So all in all, Herve maybe did learn something from Andy and improved over the years. Fun fact, his parents were also chefs. Okay, I know what you guys are thinking. 
because I'm thinking it too. These two guys screwed the pooch on this one. They had Gordon come in. He managed to put them on the right track. So much so, that even they were excited for the numbers they were doing. However, they went backward, as some articles stated and that's where they lost the ball again. Unlike Bonaparte's, these guys actually gave it a shot, but got lazy. Even after making some money, they refused to reinvest it back into their own business for a makeover, regardless of tons of clients complaining about the color. These two hard-headed boys didn't lift a finger to change it. I swear it's like they have a beetroot fetish. In my opinion the color was the problem to start with, and knowing it they never bothered to change it. They clearly didn't care what was happening with their business. They refused to listen to their clients, and as a result they probably went bust for just that reason. Customers are the lifeblood of every business. If you don't listen to the customer, you have no business, the customer is the real boss. They can fire you simply by choosing to spend their money someplace else. The demand in golf going down I personally think is an excuse to hide their own failure, and they paid the price for it. So that brings us to the end of the video guys, if you are still watching, then thank you. This is also the last episode of the season, as I have mentioned earlier. For season 2 I may be changing up a few things again, as some viewers have requested video footage. I try to avoid adding it, as YouTube has strict copyright policies on smaller channels. I will be trying to upload a new video every 7 to 10 days as well. Anyways, thanks a bunch for your support. Like the video and subscribe if you have not done so yet. That's all from me for now guys, see you next time.